Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a great day. I'm Jonathan Little, and we're here today with a little coffee. It's Wednesday. Middle of the week. Today I have a very hectic day lined up. I have a little coffee right now. Then at um, noon I have a call to try to finally fix my internet. With any luck that will happen, thanks to the person who contacted me from Verizon, who, um, you know, I guess followed me independently. So hopefully we can get a little bit of help with that. And then at two, I have an inner circle webinar, which is gonna go for, you know, four hours or so, give or take. That's how long those typically go. This seems a little bit off. Why is this a little bit off? Mm. Hmm. Well, whatever. All right. Um, the inner circle webinar is gonna be long today. I had a lot of people send in their questions, which is great. That's what I'm there for. I'm there to answer their questions. And um, if you are not part of the Inner Circle, you can find information at Jonathan or at PokerCoaching.com slash Inner Circle. There we have um, essentially office hours where you can call in, ask me your questions live, or if you can't be there live, you can send them in ahead of time, and I answer them for you. I spend about 15 to 20 minutes with each student, and I also present on a topic of their choice. I don't quite remember what the topic of today is, but there is a topic of today. We have all the regulars here. We have Mason, Louis Philippe. D. Nelson, Jason Cooper, everyone, literally everyone here. If I missed your name, sorry, I'm not the best with shout outs. I apologize, I'm an old man. All right, um, today, I wanna to talk about asking the right questions. Oh, before we get into that, there's going to be no A Little Coffee tomorrow or on Friday. Sorry, I have lots to do. Tomorrow, one of my good friends is coming over at 9 a.m. That's the only time he can make happen because he's busy as well. Then at 10 a.m. I have a coaching session with a student. And then after that, I have to make poker coaching uh, quizzes. I said I was going to do that all yesterday, and I did not. Um, I got stuck at the Apple store because my phone was broken. Um, so anyway, no little coffee Thursday or Friday or Monday. What a bummer, huh? I'm going to be in Vegas from Friday to Monday. I will be playing some live poker tournament on Sunday in Vegas. It's going to be between $100 and $200 buy-in. If you're in Vegas, uh, feel free to come play. I'll post on Twitter where we decide to go on Sunday morning. I'm going to be there with a few of my employees, so it'll be a lot of fun. Um, then Tuesday, I'll be back. So Tuesday, we'll be back. And on Tuesday, I'll actually be announcing the winner, most likely, of a giveaway I'm going to be doing on Instagram. We're going to get 10,000 followers there, so I figure I might as well have a um, some sort of a giveaway. We're going to give away, I think, a signed copy of Mastering Small Stakes in the Limit Hold'em, my book, as well as a year of poker coaching. So make sure you get on Instagram at jcardshark, and we'll be posting about that in the very near future. All right, let's get to it. Asking the right questions. Now, I certainly do not profess to be the um, master at asking all the right questions, and often I ask the wrong questions, but I think what happens to a lot of people is that whenever something in their mind some, something bothers them or something is causing them tr trouble, their first instinct is to be angry or outraged or sad or annoyed. Um, for example, say my coffee's cold right now. It's not because I learned how to make hot coffee. But say my coffee was cold because I made it at 7 a.m. and I decided to not warm it up. Why did I not decide to warm it up? Right? You want to figure out how to solve the problems in your life. Whatever that is. If you're not winning at poker, you may want to ask, how do I win at poker? Okay, so let's see. Once you've asked the big, broad question, it's a giant question, how do you win at poker? It's a little bit more difficult than how do you keep your coffee warm. But once you decide, how do I win at poker? You want to ask, well, how have other people won at poker? And you also want to look at processes people have put in place that are repeatable to allow you to win at poker. You certainly do not want to look at someone who you know won the main event and then lost everything else they touched forever because that's not a good example, right? Um, I mean, this comes up a lot in tournaments where say you have a guy, for two examples, uh, you have one player who plays $100, two players who both play $100 tournaments. One guy loses every single one over, let's say, uh, 999 games. Then uh, the other player wins at like a solid 20% ROI. But then at the end of that, they both decide to play a $1,000 tournament, and um, one, the one who loses every tournament before wins. The one who loses, wins every tournament before loses, right? 
Now you have two people who will have the same return on investment over that thousand game sample. Let's just pretend this is all hypothetical. But one player is awful. In fact, his ROI is like minus 90% or something like that. And then you have the other guy who has just a solid 20% ROI or whatever it is. And one player is way better than the other. So you have to make sure you are modeling and learning, modeling your game and learning from people who have repeatable success. And um, that's very important. It's much easier to find this in cash games than it is in tournaments because in cash games, your results are pretty indicative of your skill level, right? If you play for four years and you're just down money, you're probably not very good. Whereas if you play four years of tournaments, especially live tournaments, you could still be very good just because in tournaments, you often play very few key hands that really determine your, your win rate, right? So what I mean by this is in a cash game, say you get all in for a hundred big blind flip and you win or lose, you know, it's not that big of a deal. If you get all in for a hundred big blind flip in a tournament, well, it may not be a big deal if it happens early in the tournament because you're only playing for one buy-in. But if it happens for you late in a tournament where you're at the final table and you lose, well, that's very, very detrimental. This has been what's plaguing me recently, actually, is I've had a lot of 8th, 7th, 6th, 10th place finishes over the last few years in spots where I realize if I win this hand, I win the tournament a lot of the time. And if I don't win this hand, I lose the tournament. And that's okay. You have to understand what you sign up for. And instead of being outraged or angry or bitter that that's my results, I mean, it's you have to understand that is part of the game. Now, you also have to make sure you don't look at very specific subsets of results because, for example, if you look at my World Poker Tour only success, I have like 500% ROI, which is insane. But if you look at my World Series of Poker results, it's like minus 30% or something. So am I really good at World Poker Tours and really bad at World Series events? I mean, maybe there's a little something to that because World Poker Tour events have better structures than World Series events. But most likely I'm just running poorly at World Series events and I'm running hot at World Poker Tour events. You could also look at my results for the last few years and say, he has no wins, but he has you know lots of seventh and eighth place finishes and then go, oh, he's no good. But if you look at the results from before that, it's like all first place finishes and then like, am I the best? Like, no, it just evens out, you know, variance happens. And it doesn't necessarily even out either, especially if you don't actually play many tournaments, which is what happens in live poker. Because if you, I, don't, I don't know how many tournaments I've played in my career, but let's say I've been playing for 10 years and I play 100 tournaments a year. That's 1,000 tournaments. I mean, that's what a good online player plays in a week, right? Maybe not a week, maybe a month. So I have one month of online results and I've been playing for 10 years or more. <laughs> but... If that is me, and I actually put in a pretty good amount of volume, imagine everyone else who plays way, way, way less. So keep that in mind. Um, so anyway, asking the right questions. First off, you need to approach questions from a logical point of view. Do not approach a question when you are tilted, annoyed, ecstatic, right? You wanna have a very even keel whenever you are approaching any question, because otherwise your judgment is going to be clouded, right? You don't want your judgment to be clouded. So first, what are we trying to accomplish? Let's say you want to become a great poker player. This is an easy one because it probably applies to most of you. All right. What are the hurdles that will keep me from being a good poker player? Well, this is um, a very big, broad question, but in general, there are a few that make a lot of sense, right? Bankroll. This is a very important one. Skill level is a very important one. Volume is a very important one. Um, and general discipline. The four things that I can think of off the top of my head that are very, very vital. And if you lack any of those, say you know you lack volume, right? You know you have a family and kids and you just can't play very much. Well, that is going to be a significant hurdle. So what can you do to um, mitigate that hurdle or get, get over that hurdle? And the very easy answer to that is play online. Right? A lot of people say, oh, well, I don't want to play online. It's not legal where I live. Well, first off, it probably is legal where you live. You just think it's not. And also, understand that that is something you must deal with if you actually want to have a chance of success. So um, let's say you know you like discipline. Let's say every time you go to the casino, instead of going to the poker room, you stop by the sports book and bet $1,000 on a sporting event because that's just what you do. Right? You must master that discipline. I actually made a video with Mike Sexton. This guy, he wrote a book, Life's a Gamble. He's a, he's a gambler. 
about holding on to money. You can find that at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash holding on to money. As far as I know. If you can't find it there, it's at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash blog. GTO, Davey, welcome. Always here for the GTO morning coffee. Welcome. Um, let's say you're not very good at poker. You need to get skill, right? Well, first off, bankroll. Bankroll's an easy one. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll and I explain how to get a bankroll. Next, um, skill level. This is the hard one. This is the one that most people lack. Most people think they have this, though, but they don't. Um, if you lack skill, you want to ask yourself, what are the good players doing that I am not doing? Why are they succeeding when I'm not succeeding? Because in reality, everyone gets the same cards in the long run. Obviously, there will be variants, but in general, if you are good, you will be. You will rise to the top. You will be... Um, you just will. It happens, inevitably. I mean, certainly there are some players who are bankrolled to play, let's say, 25k tournaments, whereas other players are bankrolled to play 5k tournaments, despite playing the same sample of tournaments. But, for the most part, if you are great, you will get a hold of money in poker. That's just how it works. It, it's a it's a merit-based game, not a, um, you know, seniority-based game like many corporate jobs. So, how do you get the skill level? You study what other good players are doing. And study it hard. If you figure out that some people go through a specific course or they do specific routines. That will be very, very important for you to figure out what they're doing and get into it. For example, um, a lot of people go through my site, pokercoaching.com, and that's a great way to go about it. A lot of people watch tons and tons of training videos. A lot of people sign up to a backing site like Pokar. They give you a bankroll and they teach you. I mean, that's, that's great, right? They also teach you discipline. And what was the other thing I said? I forgot already. Um, that's the problem when you wing these. Um, so, I mean, right there, they, they teach you and they give you a bankroll. That makes life easy for you, right? A lot of people who go into Pokar, if they actually do work hard and they succeed, they rise to the top. I mean, they have many, many players who've won the Sunday Million multiple times, won WCOOP main events, et cetera, et cetera. And because they went through the program, there's a program there that will teach you to win. It's hard. It takes a lot. Oh, volume. That was the other thing. It takes a lot of um, effort and a lot of work. But that is what is required if you want to succeed at poker. Now, um, again, you can apply this to pretty much any thing that you are dealing with. Let's say I want to have warm coffee in the morning and not cold. Well, the obvious answer is make it at nine, at 8.55, 8 right? Then it'll be nice and hot. But what if I have something going on at 8.55? Well, now I have to make the coffee earlier, and then I have to warm it in some way. Do we warm it on the stove, or do we warm it in the microwave? Well, microwave works fine for me, and, um, you know, that's that. But... That's not a hard problem. Uh, a lot of people do have hard problems though, like how do I make enough money to pay my rent? Well, figure out what you're doing in your spare time first off. If you have a lot of spare time where you're not doing anything productive or even worse, spending money, then stop that and start doing something productive. An easy way to do something productive is to just start going on Craigslist or go on Facebook, one of the two sites. They have places where people just give stuff away for free. Go get the free stuff and then sell it easy, right? There are people out there who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year by going to Walmart, going to their clearance section, buying everything in their clearance section, selling it on eBay the next day, and they're making 100k a year working, you know, they're working 10 or 12 hours a day, but they are doing this. It is possible. It takes almost no capital to get started. You may need like 100 bucks to buy a thing or two, and you can do it if you want. The question is, do you want? That's the problem. Most people do not actually want to go through the work to get the results they want. They want to instead complain. We are not complainers here. We are doers. We get the job done. And anything in life that you are unhappy about, anything that you are having a difficult time with, is overcomable if you are willing to put in the work. Dustin says, thank you for making your drive to work every day enjoyable. I'm glad you enjoy it. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Sorry I'm not here every single day. But, um, you know, life. <laughs> Brad Olson says, Pokar. Yeah, Pokar is good. All right, let's see. Everyone needs to read the Bankroll Bible. Thank you, I'm Willing Wilmington. Go to um, jlpoker.com slash bankroll and you can find it. Pokar is P-O-C-A-R-R dot -R com. What do they look for when applying? They want someone who has some proven results at small stakes. You don't have to be a big stakes player. You can be playing tiny stakes. They want good results. They want good volume. They want you to see that you can play a decent amount at a time. Because again, like I just said, volume is important. And um, 
I don't know what else they're looking for. Go there, apply. Nim says, you turned on automatically, interrupting your chess play. Bad beat. I turn on automatically? Is that a thing? You can just say, hey, turn Jonathan Will on automatically? All right. Um, my mom's here. Hello, Rita Little. Welcome. Jason says, you're 20-an-hour... A week cash game grinder in position to begin 45 hours or more. Any tips for taking a significant leap into significant volume? Realize it's just all the same. Um, try to not get overwhelmed by the fact that you are playing more. I definitely suggest that you do a trial before you become a pro or do anything serious like that. And you can do that by, if you have a job, just take two weeks off from your job and only go play poker during those two weeks. See if you can handle it. And if you can handle it, then you're probably good to go. But really, I mean, playing 45 hours a week isn't even that much. I mean, whenever I used to play at Bellagio every day, I would play, well, 10 hours a day every day, so 70 hours a week. And that was just normal. This is what I did, right? So 70 was no problem for me, but it might not be a problem for most people because they have life, they have family and all that, and I get that. But find what works for you. Henry says, you owe me a shout out because now you are winning $31 an hour over 4,000 hours? That's a lot of hours. If you're winning 31 bucks an hour at 1-3 over 4,000 hours, or small stakes, you didn't say 1-3, uh, move up. If you're crushing for 31 at small stakes, move up, play bigger, make even more money. That'll be great. All right. Um, okay, what else? So you need to figure out the hurdles and how to overcome them. Also, you want to try to figure out what is actively under your control and what is not, right? If you're playing, let's say you're playing online and you see that everything's going great in terms of your um, expected EV, say you're playing cash games, but your results are like break even. Say you play 10,000 hands, you break even, but you see your EV graph going up, your expected value graph going up. This is a nice feature of programs like Hold'em Manager. They will tell you how much you quote unquote should be up if you broke even, not broken, you got your you got your equity out of every all in. So say you get it all in with 70% equity and you lose, well, um, you know, you lost, you lose, uh, you lose 100 big blinds. But in reality, you should have won 70% of that pot instead of 0% of that pot, right? So it averages that out for you. So if you see that your EV graph is going up, but you're, um, you know, you're breaking even or even you're losing, understand that that's not under your control. You don't get to pick when you win. And over 10,000 hands, insane stuff happens, especially if you're playing tournaments where, you know, like I said, if you lose one of those rare flips late in the evening, <laughs> whenever you're playing deep, deep, deep in the tournament for a bunch of chips, if you lose that, well, you're, you're screwed. You're going you're gonna to have bad results. You just are right? You don't get very many big shots. So understand that that is out of your control and don't worry about it. Do not worry about things that are not in your control because you can't do anything about them. Now you may want to ask, do I want to get into something where there are so many things out of my control? And um, the answer to that may be no, right? Um, this happens a lot in investing, for example. Like let's say you are a small fry like myself and you want to buy stock of, of something. Let's say um, General Motors. We're going to buy some General Motors stock. Well, do I have any control over General Motors stock? The answer is obviously no, right? I have no control over this. But if you have done your research, you think it's going to go up and you know they have a good team behind them, then maybe it's a good investment. But there's a lot of uncertainty. And so you have to ask yourself, are you fine with uncertainty? And some people are and some people aren't. If you're not fine with uncertainty, poker tournaments especially may not be for you. And um, poker in general may not be for you. You have to be quite comfortable with uncertainty. Now, clearly in poker, you have more control than you do in investing, right? Because in investing, you have like literally no control. Whereas in um, poker, you actually have, do have a bit of control because you get to pick how much study you have. It's like how much inside infor insider information do you have in uh, stock investing, right? If you have lots of insider information, you're, you're lock of the century. Clearly don't do anything illegal. Um, let's say someone in your family gets sick. A lot of people say, why is this happening to me? They feel as if something has happened to them. Um, Dr. Trisha Carter talks about this some in her, in her books, Positive Poker and Peak Poker Performance that I wrote with her. And you have to realize that bad things are inevitably going to happen to you and good things are going to happen to you too. Sometimes you get a raise, sometimes you get fired, right? And... Sometimes it really is completely out of your control, and sometimes things are inevitable. For example, I'm probably not going to live forever. As much as I would like it, I'm probably not going to live forever. I'm going to die. That's going to be sad for my family, yes, assuming they still like me. My computer just made a noise. Hopefully everything's still working. 
Um, and with any luck, they will be able to accept that with no problem move on, and move on with their lives productively. I do not want them grieving or spending time doing things that are not productive. I want them to move forward happily, understanding that I had a good life and that was that. Now, I understand this is easier said than done, but I do think that looking at every issue that presents itself to you and realizing I have no control over this, or if I do have no control over this, how do I get over this is very beneficial. Like for example, in poker, variance is a big issue, but there is an easy solution to variance. Easy. And the solution is volume. Volume cures variance, right? Um, I suppose um, having 15 families cures caring about any individual one of them. But uh, that's not really how life works this time. So, let's see what all of you are saying. Good morning to everyone. Everyone's saying good morning. Good morning, good morning. We are here bright and early. Thank you all for being here. I think we have at least eight viewers today. I want to thank, again, all eight of you for being here. I know it is early for most of you. One thing that's helped me is... Um, this book here, it's called The Daily Stoic. Let me backwards. I've actually been kind of lax with reading this because I've been incredibly busy. But every day it presents you a, um, a, little short, a little short essay, usually something from a Stoic author, and then um, a little uh, information about it. This one for September 17th says, Dealing with Haters. Oh, wow, this was perfect. September 16th. Anyone can get lucky. Not everyone can persevere. It's true. Anyone can get lucky, but not everyone can persevere. Want nothing equals have everything. It's very true. What to do when you feel lazy? Silence is strength. Silence is a lesson learned from the many sufferings of life. Sometimes it's better just to sit there and be quiet. It's important to realize, you know, some people out there probably think I talk a lot and they probably think um, I'd probably know more than I do. And I want to make it very clear to you that I did not say anything to anyone for a very, very long time. I was incredibly, I'm not going to say necessarily shy, but I did not want to embarrass myself. But over the last 15 years, I have studied my butt off at poker. I've worked very hard. And now I actually do know what I'm talking about, and I'm confident that I know what I'm talking about, and that I can help many, many people. And you'll realize, I don't talk about stuff that I do not know about, right? I think a lot of people think that because they know about one thing, they know everything. I mean, here I have a book here. Mastering Bitcoin, how many of you have done this, right? I realize lots of people in the poker community want to um, talk about Bitcoin, for example. Do you know what BIP-9 signaling and activation means? I have no clue. I don't know. That's why I don't give any advice on things like this. Um, in terms of investing, right? I actually don't know a whole lot because everyone I've talked to who does know a lot says, sir, you and no one else knows a lot and you're not going to know a lot. I've learned, right? It's very important to know what you know and what you don't know. And... Um, I only talk once I know about something, and I think that that is very, very important for a lot of people to understand. Just because you have an opinion does not mean your opinion is valid, or even that it needs to be shared. I think a lot of people feel entitled to the idea that their opinion should be broadcast. The internet has made this incredibly easy, and I don't know if that's good or bad. It certainly has given voices to people who have previously not had a voice, which is certainly good and beneficial, but at the same time, it's also caused um, lots and lots of rubbish to be spread around and that's a problem right a lot of people talk when they just because they can talk people want to be validated yeah and you know a neat thing about the internet is that there's always people who are like you you can say the most obscene insane things and there will be people out there who agree with you right i mean just think of anything and, and you'll find it you'll google it and you'll find a group and i, I think the, the people who I try to model my life after, people who I think are wise, realize that um, they don't know everything and that they know when, when they know something, they know it well, and they are very willing to help people with that. And, you know, to be fair, to help someone, you really just need to know the thing better than they know it. And, I mean, for example, I probably know Bitcoin better than 
let's say there are eight people here, probably all eight of them. Um, but I'm definitely not a pro, definitely not smart at it, definitely not wise at it, so I keep my mouth shut because I am not a fool. Fools talk for no good reason. So keep that in mind whenever you are obtaining content and um, absorbing content because most people out there really don't know what they're talking about. They're talking because they can. And I don't personally, I mean, this is just my, I guess, philosophy, my stoic philosophy. I do not think that is a good enough reason. All right. Kevin says, Bitcoin's up 11% today. Great. Assuming you have any Bitcoin left. What, what is um what is 11% times $1? Is that a lot? All right, let's see. We have a poker hand Alan wants to ask me about. 17 people left. Everyone folds to a aggressive player on the button. Who raises? You have king, queen, and the big blind with 21 big blinds. You go all in. Easy all in. All right. What else do we have to talk about? Stoicism in general. I mean, listen... If you constantly encounter ups and downs in life and you, you have big swings in emotion, that's going to make you lose your mind. It really will. I know a lot of people like to act super happy and act super sad when things go well or go poorly. But at the end of the day, most things that happen to you are not in your control. For example, well... I was going to say, whenever you invest in something, if it goes up or down, it's often not in your control. But in investing, you do get to pick when to buy in. Um, a lot of people choose the wrong times, though. They listen to the hype. They listen to the rubbish. I mean, I've been guilty of this. I did it with gold a long time ago. And um, it, it's important to realize that just because everyone thinks something is going to happen does not mean it's going to, and very likely it won't. I mean, there's this idea in sports betting that an easy way to roughly at least break even is to bet against the public whenever the public is heavily on one side. Like, say, for example, 80% um, of the bets are on Team B. Well, you bet on Team A kind of regardless of what the line is. Usually you want to bet last minute because the line moves in favor of Team A as time progresses, so you get a better line if you bet last second. If you see the line on Team A getting worse... But 80% of the bets are on the other side. What does that mean? It means that the people who are betting huge money are betting on the other side, which means who you really want to be on that side. It's called a steam move. Anyway, um, that happens in real life too, right? If you see everyone betting on a stock, it might be time to short it. I mean, we, you see this happening with a lot of the tech stocks now, right? The tech stocks, tech stocks are very, very high. And um, now you see, well, they were high. Huh. Now they're getting beaten down a little bit, right? You saw Bitcoin, right? It was through the roof. The graph is like, pew, and now it's, pew. funny enough, um, people say Bitcoin is digital gold. Go back and look at the graph of gold. You're not going to be very happy with the result. Assuming you look at the peaks. Um, probably isn't though. It's probably just a stupid name. All right. Hard part is making sure the rubbish doesn't get into your head. You know it's bad info, you can feel it, but sometimes it affects you. That, that is true. That is the problem. So, what can you do? I highly suggest you go to sources that are valid. If um, Jonathan Little, tomorrow, was to make a YouTube channel about, well, probably anything besides exactly poker, or Magic the Gathering, or maybe a little bit of advice like this, you should probably think he's lost his mind. If I all of a sudden make a YouTube channel about, let's say, angel investing, I do have plenty of angel investments, but I'm not a pro. Probably one of the things I'm slightly more qualified to talk about than most, but certainly not qualified, you should think that I'm a fraud. If I decide to make a YouTube channel about being a good lawyer tomorrow, something I don't know much about besides the fact that my wife's a lawyer, you should definitely think I'm a fraud. And it's important to realize that, again, just because you can talk does not mean you can. And the internet makes it very, very, very easy to talk and to get your words out. And if you have charisma or if you use good marketing strategies, you will be able to get in front of people. Um, 
there are many marketing strategies available. There, are, I think there are five key ones that I've read about. Um, one of them is build a community. We're here every morning with our community, right? This is a marketing strategy. I'm getting all of you here. We're having talks. We're having fun. You're all talking to each other in the chat. This is great, right? We're having a community. You can provide immense value. I do my best to provide immense value. Hopefully, you all appreciate it. Um, what are the other ones? I mean, again, this is the problem with uh, doing this on the fly. I have this all on my iPad. Um, I do know one that I do not use, and that is spreading of hatred. It's very, very easy to get a group of people if you outrage them and make them angry. But the problem is that those people are not that valuable of people in my opinion. They want to tear things down. I want to build things up. The poker community, for example, I'm not trying to tear down the poker community. I'm trying to build it up, which inevitably leads to me generally just not being a hater, right? Certainly there are things that I will disagree with and I will bring them up in a respectful manner, but a lot of people out there don't do that. They, they instead try to tear people down. And that is a shame, honestly, because they are not providing enough value and they are not building a positive community such that they can actually be a good person. Understand, though, if you're a bad person, you probably listen to bad people. If you're a good person, you probably listen to good people. And that's just where you'll naturally flow, right? Tournament question. Let's say you have built up a nice stack using fold equity. Using fear. I don't think fear is fold equity, but go ahead. Anyway, what approach should we take towards fold equity when our table gets broken and we get moved to a new table? I mean, just keep playing your game. GTO Davies says, Doug Polk has quite a few YouTube channels. I don't know anything about what he has going on. For some of the reasons I just mentioned. <laughs> All right, let's see. <clears throat> Always check a different source and understand what their resume is, what they agree and what they disagree on and why. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's, it's difficult to find a good source. Ideally, you want to... Um, you want to find people who have good results. That's what it amounts to, right? You also want to find people who make reasonable recommendations. Um, I think a lot of people, well, this is another issue. I mean, it's completely not related to everything else we've been talking about, but whenever you watch the news channels or, you know, YouTube channels, for example, a lot of people like making predictions. And then when their predictions are wrong, they forget about them. But when their predictions are right, they gloat as if they've made some sort of genius prediction. So there's no punishment when they're wrong. And there's maximum upside when they're right, which leads to a lot of people making predictions. Again, you will probably not hear me saying any sort of insane prediction like, um, I think the World Series of Poker is going to have 50,000 people next year, right? It might, but that'd be dumb to say. I would never tell you to put 50% of your money in any individual stock or gold or Bitcoin or a house or whatever. I think that's silly. It's not a good idea. And... It's important to realize that when you hear things like this, it's just not good advice. And instead it is like hype building because if something does succeed, say real estate all of a sudden quadruples in value and you put half your value in a house, you're gonna look like you're doing great. Houses aren't actually a good example though because if you have one house and your house goes up 50%, it's worth more money. But if you sell it to buy a new house, you get the same value, right? Um, a better example would be, let's say you buy a stock, let's say GM stock again, and it goes up 50%, you can turn around and sell that for an undervalued stock so you actually do make value in that manner. You only really make value when you're trading um, from one asset class to another asset class to some extent. What's the name of that training site? I mentioned pokercoaching.com. That's my site. And then the backing site is pokar.com, P-O-C-A-R-R.com. So anyway, people who make predictions are silly and they are often doing it at the detriment of their audience. Another thing worth mentioning is that whenever you open yourself up to your audience feeling bad, you will inevitably cannibalize some of your audience. You can do this in a few ways. Um, well, the most obvious way we're talking about here is the prediction issues, right? Um, say, say I say Bitcoin is going to go up 50% by the end of the year, and then it doesn't. And some of you listen to me and think that I'm an authority because I have a book on Bitcoin behind me, then what's going to happen? Well, inevitably, you are going to put your hard-earned money into something that I literally know 
nowhere near as much as a professional knows about. And then you are going to get hosed. If you get hosed, how are you going to feel towards me? Right? I'm not trying to hose you all. I'm trying to help you all, which is why I only give advice that I am quite confident will work. Now, you may ask, you know, what, what is the confidence threshold required to give advice? And that's a tough one because imagine I do know that I know more about, let's say, Bitcoin than all of you or seven out of eight of you who are here. Then should I be giving advice? And I would generally say the answer is still no. Instead, what I should do, and this is what I always do whenever people send me an email asking me about a game that I am not a good pro at, I send them to an authority, someone who I respect, right? When someone sends me a message asking for deuce to seven triple draw coaching, I don't say, yeah, sure, let's go, because I can collect your money and maybe help you a little bit. I send them to someone who is a professional at that game. That's just the good thing to do. And again, just because you have a voice, just because you have a platform, just because you can type on Twitter, does not mean that you need to be giving out your opinion. Now, you may want to be retweeting people whose opinions are well-respected, who are authorities. Nothing wrong with that at all. But uh, don't, don't get yourself into trouble by, by listening to people who are try, trying to um, hype themselves up. Again, it's a difficult thing. It really is a difficult thing. People keep asking how to spell pokar. <laughs> Greg says, I've said it like five times. Yeah, you should probably listen. Listen to what I'm saying. All right. Your two bullets at Seminole Hard Rock. You flopped a set of eights against aces. Well, that's fine. And your aces ran into queens on the river. That's fine. Again, Miguel, you cannot control things that are out of your control, so don't worry about it. It's irrelevant, right? Anytime you get unlucky in a tournament, you should be happy. You may ask why you should be happy if you lose all of your money. Because your loss was out of your control. You got your money in good, and you lost. Now, that said, Miguel, I don't know how many chips you have. Quite often, people blind down, blind down, blind down, blind down until they get the nuts and they get it all in and they lose and they're shocked. But you have to realize in those spots, you're going to lose 5 or 10% of the time each time, maybe more depending on how the hand played out. And ideally, you want to make sure that you do not lose to any one individual bad beat. A lot of people think, I got my money in good, therefore I played great. But that is not necessarily true. And I would venture to say that most of the best tournament players actually don't get their money in all that great. Probably like 50% equity or 55% equity. And that's because they're stealing a lot of small pots. They're winning lots of pots with no showdown. And when you win lots of pots with no showdown, you get to lose many of your all-ins. I mean, that's what's been happening to me in these World Poker Tour tournaments where I get two times an average sack, and then there's blinds get shallow, and then I lose three hands and I'm out, whereas everybody else gets to lose one or two hands. But, you know, you can still lose three hands. All right, let's see what all of you are saying. Louis Fleep says, I provide great value. Well, good. Thank you. I do my best. Aria is short deck on Sunday. Well, I'm not going to go into Aria then. All right. How often do you rely on body language and reads and intuition? That's a lot of different things there, but I'm in tough spots. I rely on that whenever the opponent is not very good. When the opponent is good, I completely ignore it. Louis Fleep says, need to bluff to survive. That is absolutely true. That's how you get chips. We teach that at PokerCoaching.com. You all know that. Good, good, good. What's my thought process when I'm thinking? I am counting the combinations of hands that I beat to hands that I lose to. Do I try to imagine the range as if it's an equal lap? No, I imagine the range as if it is in the float the turn range analyzer. That's what I do. Do you recall past hands? Um, I usually do that way before the hand starts. And I, like, I don't think very often that... Say you're playing a tournament and you see some guy check 2.3x in one spot on the turn and you see him check 2.5x later on the turn. I don't think that's that big of a deal. Some people do, some people don't. I don't think it's that big of a deal. And I know that I'm going to have an impossible time correlating that to hand strength. So what I'm usually thinking about is what does this player's range look like in my mind? Again, it's not my range that they are playing. It's their range. So you know, all the previous examples that they've played plays into that. And then I'm trying to figure out how many combinations of hands I beat how many combinations of hands I lose to, then I compare that to the pot odds, then I make a call or a fold. Do I offer, offer personal coaching? On personal matters, I'm not a life coach. I've never tried to be a life coach. Um, one of my students, who is a, actually a well-known celebrity, he tells me that I am his therapist. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But um, 
I do offer private coaching. You can email support at pokercoaching.com if you want information on it. But no, I'm very, very busy at the moment. Where a common tells of amateur players. Did I have this book? I think I moved it. There's a book called um, Reading Poker Tells. I think that's what it's called. By, gosh, Zach Elwood. He actually has a chapter in uh, this book up here. Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. Where is he? Oh, he's not on the cover. I remember he did not want to be on the cover for some reason. Look at this page. Isn't this page cool? I have a few of these that are signed by um, lots of the authors. And we give these away at uh, charity events and whatnot. I think these are cool books. Um, okay, where is this section? Where is this section? Page 196. There we go. Right in the middle of the book. Let's go through here and try to find some tells that he recommends. General theory of poker tells, they vary, right? How often does the poker tell happen? How much have you correlated it? How important is this situation? Common poker tells, all right, indicators of folding. Yeah, so a lot of people will indicate when they are folding, like say it folds to you in the cutoff and um, you see the, bu the button about to folding, right? But, uh, but the button is about to fold and the small blind's watching TV. Well, now you notice there's you against the, um, the, the big blind and you're, you're free to steal as much as you want, right? Um, long looks at hole cards. The most common pattern is people who stare for a while when initially looking at their hole cards are unlikely to have strong hands. There you go. Staring at the board cards. People who stare at the board are unlikely to have strong hands. Carlton says that uh, there must be a, a hack to, to flip the uh, Instagram image. I don't know how to do it. Defensive chip handling. People are like, yeah, I'm going to call you. Or, yeah, I'm going to bet. Very often they don't bet. Should I spoil this whole chapter? Talks about eyes, stillness, strange behavior. Strong will sometimes just means strong. Smiling. Immediate calls, immediate bets. There's, there's a lot. I mean, look, it's a 500-page book, okay? Excelling at No Limit Hold'em, you can find this. And I actually did a lot of webinars. I did one with Zach Elwood about, um, it's called Tuning Into Tells, where I went through lots of real examples where he got footage from, I think it was Heartland Poker Tour or Mid-States Poker Tour, one of those. And he reviewed lots and lots of hands with me. Um, I did webinars with lots of these other authors. You can find this at hold'embook.com, H-O-L-D-E-M-B-O-O-K.com. Or if you want to type in the whole title, excelling at no limit hold'em.com, that'll come up too. This is a very good book. One of the books, probably the book I'm most proud of. This book, well, first off, it's like one of the best sellers in poker, which is great. Still, after it's been out for two, like, I think two or three years. And it's a collaboration, right? Most people in the poker world are not so good at playing with others. You see this with a lot of people. I mean, especially some people who are actually vocal. They get in spats with each other. And it's often about silly things. Which often indicates they're not good with playing with each other. Every single one of these people was easy enough to play with. Some of them had their quirks, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, these were all good people who wanted to help the poker community. And um, they were happy to work with me because they knew I would get the job done. And they all got the job done, too. We'll put that there. Goodbye, Mike Sexton. Actually, Mike Sexton's still uh, right there. We work with Mike Sexton. Funny enough, um, after that book came out, I let my publishers know, some of the, you know, the great people, and now Mike Sexton has a book with D&B Poker. Phil Helmuth has a book with D&B Poker. And uh, Alex Fitzgerald has a book with D&B Poker. We have found people who are happy to help, who don't mind working, who will turn in good content on time, and that's great, right? Opportunities come when you put yourself out there, and I'm happy to be able to provide that to the poker community. Should you show one card when your opponent's tanking on the river? I don't actually think that's allowed a lot of the time. Mark, you need to email support at pokercoaching.com with any support issues. Have I read Ed Miller's The Course? I have not. He said he enjoyed that book. Great, I'm glad to hear that. 
You recently took a job as a blackjack dealer. There are a lot more people out there than you thought with a gambling problem. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people with a gambling problem. And those are just at blackjack. Hooded welcome. When you min raise, your whole continuing range on a paired board that is better for your range is the plan to bet large on the turn with the entire range. No, often the plan is to bet small on the turn with the entire range and then bet big on the river. Um, if you cannot run a three street bet in that scenario or three street bluff in that scenario, very often you should not make the play. But you can check min raise flop for like four big blinds, bet three big blinds on the turn, then bet 15 on the river. And that's how you can easily get in a 20 big blind stack. That's often the plan. But you should be giving up with some of your bluffs. Don't think you should be bluffing off every single time. And some of your bluffs will turn into marginal made hands. Let's see. You're saying your second tournament of the day. 200 players start. Today you have 50. Is 31 big blinds okay to start with? Oh, wait. I'm not sure what you're saying. I think basically you're saying you have 31 big blinds. Well, good luck. Run hot. <laughs> The community is what you've been looking for in the poker world. We're going to do a lot of things to make this happen in 2019, I think. Again, we're going on a company retreat in a few days. And um, we're going to talk about more about community because that's something I've not been doing so well at because, honestly, I don't want to sit on a forum all day. But I do know that lots of people like forums. And, um, you know, like this here is a community building activity, right? You all are talking with each other, communicating with each other. And I think that's great. You think hero calling is a must-have skill to be profitable? Well, yes. I mean, you need to call whenever you beat your opponent's range based on the pot odds, and often that means calling with a wide range. How long do I think con concepts in a book come out of date after you publish a book? Well, if you publish bad books, they become out of date immediately. If you publish good books, they stay relevant for a very, very long time. Fortunately, my books have stayed very relevant for a very long time. What a lot of people do is they write books not based on actual knowledge, but on speculation. And when you speculate you're gonna be wrong a lot of the time. When you uh, make books based on knowledge or math, or knowledge based on math, you'll find that most of your strategies hold up quite well. All right, so I think we're gonna be done for the day. Let's see. Turn play with top set. You beat six combinations, you lose to 16, opponent shoves, 60 big blinds into 70, what do we do? Well, Louis Philippe, this is a math problem, right? You lose three-fourths of the time, you win one-fourth of the time, your pot odds dictate you need to win 33% of the time, and you're only going to win 25%, so you should fold, right? That's a good example, Louis Philippe. Uh, people ask what you're thinking about on the river. Say you know your opponent has 16 combinations of hands you beat, six combinations, I'm sorry, 16 combinations that you lose to, six that you beat, and that's exactly their range, you have a very easy fold. Because your pot odds say you need to win 33%, 30, 33%, and your, um, I mean, sorry, what am I saying? Yeah, pot odds say you need to win 33, but you're only going to win 25, because 6 divided by 22 or whatever it is is 25%. Um, the problem, though, is that often your opponent will have the 16 and the 6, but then some unknown number of bluffs. Now, this is where you have to figure out how your opponent plays, right? Some people will bluff with another 40 combinations of hands, in which case you have an easy call. Some people bluff with two more combinations of hands, in which case you still have an easy fold. Some people bluff with the optimal number, in which case you're roughly break-even, which makes it tough, right? But if you know your opponents, often people bluff too much or they don't bluff enough, and once you know that, then it becomes quite easy. All right. Any, um, Hooded says, you missed the video today, or missed the show today, but you'll go back and watch it. Yeah, anytime any of you miss these uh, little coffees, you can go back and watch them on YouTube or Twitch, youtube.com slash float the turn, and then twitch.com slash Jonathan Little, I think. Or you can find them on, um, you can find them on iTunes. All right, that's going to be it for today. Good job, good luck. I will see you all again on Tuesday, unless I see you live in Vegas. Um, again, I'm going to be playing some tournament somewhere, $100 to $200 tournament probably, in Vegas on Sunday. I'll be there with a few of my employees, and it'll be lots of fun. All right, have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Be positive. Be helpful. Just be a good person. And only focus on the things that are under your control. Have a great day. Talk to you later.